Thank you, Janet, for uh, inviting me to speak at this um, conference here. And I'm excited to share my work about utilizing susceptibility and resistance genes to develop firebite, fire blight resistant apple varieties, apple cultivars via breeding and genome editing. Um, so uh, I focus specifically on fire blight. It's caused by the bacteria Erwinia and mylavra, which characteristically is a necrotrophic endophytic bacteria, meaning that it seeks to uh, kill tissue and subsist off that dead material entering through uh, natural openings or wounds created from um, natural weather events or mechanical damage, uh, as well as regular natural openings such as uh, hydrothodes and, and uh, stomata and whatnot. And if it affects all major tissue types, including uh, fruits, young shoots, branches, blossoms, and rootstocks. Uh, and I highlight young shoots and blossoms uh, because that's the main source, uh, uh, the main entrance for uh, new infection, especially blossoms um, during bloom time. Getting blossom blight is, is the main uh, uh, primary infection of this bacteria. And uh, throughout New York and, and the United States, as well as many parts of the world, um, in the United States, especially, we've been experiencing uh, large outbreaks, uh, one notably in, in uh, 20 years ago in Michigan, about a 600 acre loss. Uh, and around that same time, the average revenue loss for the US um, for growers was about $100 million. Um, and in this case, one event was 42 million. And we're still experiencing outbreaks today. Uh, in 2020, the USDA mouse collection uh, experienced an outbreak that resulted in loss of uh, hundreds of trees and that had to be heavily cut back and uh, marked to be replaced. And that was um, the strains identified in that event were uh, found to be streptomycin resistant. So the need for genetic resistance in our commercial cultivars is, is more important than ever. And uh, given that the vast majority of our commercial cultivars are susceptible to fire blight. There's, there's a, a, a great need and a lot of work going into how we can speed up that uh, and accelerate the improvement of these cultivars uh, without losing the elite food quality that is required to uh, meet market standards. So it, that comes with a lot of biological barriers to achieve a highly fire blight, uh, uh, a fire blight resistant cultivar that also meets uh, those fruit quality standards. Uh, some of the biological barriers include um, the sexual, sexual compatibility issues. Most of the major effects, QTL and candidate genes for fire blight um, that we know and are well characterized uh, exist in wild malice species such as on the right here, um, malice robusta, malice fusca, malice floribunda. These are very strong uh, fire blight resistance genes that um, cannot be used in a typical crossing scheme uh, due to sexual uh, inca incompatibility with Malus domestica. So this, this leads us to having interest in species like Malus diversii, which is in the B column here, uh, mainly for its moderate fruit size, uh, identification of Malus diversii sessions with strong and stable fire blight resistance, as well as its sexual compatibility with Malus domestica. Um, so this can be uh, more readily used uh, in domesticated backgrounds, working towards that goal of a resistant elite cultivar. Uh, and uh, if we were to make a wide cross and specific cross with you know, uh, a wild species that have these small astringent fruits, um, the, it would take nearly four generations with five years uh, per juvenile cycle uh, to actually achieve that. So it would be around 20 years worth of breeding to actually recover that fruit quality, um, breeding back to the recurrent parent. So one of the ways we want to leverage uh, some of the uh, resistance that we're finding in Malus diversii is through mapping uh, new QTL for fire blight resistance in the Malus diversii genome. So we can create markers uh, that can be used as tools in a conventional breeding scheme to do marker assisted selection. So we have in uh, collaboration with the USDA, a population of uh, Royal Gala crossed with two different Malus diversii parents uh, that are resistant to fire blight, Royal Gala being highly susceptible. And among the progeny, 
um, through artificial inoculations in the greenhouse. We can identify a range of um, susceptible and resistant progeny and having um, genome-wide markers on each of these progeny, we can make statistical associations to give us an understanding of where in the genome, which of the 17 chromosomes harbor uh, new resistance QTL and possible candidate genes for fire plate resistance. Um, and that's some of what we're finding. You can see in the chart below, um, the higher points uh, of these peaks uh, above the threshold uh, show us evidence of which chromosome, um, which linkage groups here have evidence of um, a QTL in that region or a, uh, uh, a locus that's associated with the trait. And, you know, introducing the idea of both resistance uh, and susceptibility genes, I think it's important to make a quick distinction between them. Um, whereas uh, resistance genes are mainly defined as, as a gene that will um, aim to disrupt the, path, the, the proliferation of the pathogen, uh, mainly by producing resistance proteins that have uh, relatively narrow functions of pathogen recognition and uh, triggering of the immune responses. Um, these have a relatively um, narrow definition, a very clear definition, as you know, this has been the main focus of breeding in, uh, across many crops. Um, but uh, the idea of susceptibility genes is kind of like the, the other side of the coin in that it's a, it's a, a wider definition. It's any gene uh, that aids in the success of the pathogen in that whatever that gene codes for, whichever protein, uh, if uh, the pathogen can manipulate it, say it be uh, some basic function like a water transporter or a sugar transporter, the pathogen can manipulate it to better its environment and increase its success uh, on in infecting the host. That's something that we could likely call uh, a susceptibility gene. And minimizing or eliminating the influence of these genes uh, which I'll talk more about, is one method that we can uh, focus on to, to decrease the severity of infections um, in a new uh, cultivar. So um, there are two known susceptibility genes that have been well characterized and validated in, uh, in malice. It's hypum and dipum, which are uh, very disease specific and indirect directly with effector proteins of Erwinia amylavra. Uh, and something we're interested in is studying the natural variation of these gene sequences. So you can see on the x-axis here, uh, nine different uh, dipum and hypum genes. And within those gene sequences, uh, we are able to identify across a diverse panel of malice accessions, um, SNP mutations that we could then run statistical associations with their disease severity scores to identify which of these markers um, show a reduction in susceptibility, which, which variation, um, which allele that you inherit, um, which one confers a reduction in susceptibility. And we identified two, uh, two SNP mutations and two different genes, type 2B and 4B, that confer a, a two to five fold reduction in susceptibility. Uh, and what's interesting about these is that they can be converted into markers, uh, and these are heritable mutations that can be used in conventional breeding within Malus domestica, um, which is the, the, the idea here is that we don't have to uh, cross in or um, utilize wild species. These genes exist uh, within most species of Malus, so uh, we can leverage the diversity that's within Malus domestica already for breeding. Uh, another approach um, on the other end of, of looking at the natural variation is uh, utilizing genome editing techniques to knock out these susceptibility genes. There has been a lot of great work um, to both validate and characterize these genes. And for both hypum and dipum, there have been uh, papers that have come out knocking out these genes or knocking down and uh, basically turning off uh, their expression and uh, eliminating their function. And then we are able to evaluate against the control to see how much uh, reduction in susceptibility of a cultivar, say like Gala on the top here, Golden Delicious, uh, you end up seeing. So uh, in this paper you're here from Collaborator of ours 2019, um, knocking out Dipum 4B. 
you can see uh, on average, they had a 50% reduction in susceptibility as opposed to control in the first panel here. You can see there's a high level of susceptibility. Uh, and then with the transformance uh, list showed here, uh, they had a recovery and actually had upper growth after uh, several weeks of, uh, of infection period. Um, and what this does is allow us to bypass um, biological obstacles, uh, meaning that we don't have to worry about making the wide process for mild species. Um, we can edit within Malus domestica and potentially maintain that elite fruit quality, given that we're only targeting a single gene that is highly disease specific and, and could possibly not interact with um, any major fruit development pathways. Uh, so it's minimal effects, but uh, interestingly enough, there's some promising results coming out of this. But um, this, uh, the techniques for this particular study are still uh, considered transgenic and would be subject to USDA regulations. Uh, which might slow down uh, deregulation and cultivar release to be used in, uh, uh, in production. So one technique that we're looking at is biolistic bombardment, which uh, can be done in DNA-free manner where there's no introduction of uh, foreign DNA material. Uh, so we essentially take uh, tissue culture plants here that we can keep on a gel medium and keep in a sterile environment. Um, we coat gold particles with uh, or genome editing products, uh, protein and a, a guide RNA that will make the, the edit that we desire. We will um, put them in a vacuum chamber, pressurize with helium and fire the gold particles into the leaf material uh, on a medium that allow them to regenerate back into a new plant. And the genome editing products here, the Cas9, uh, protein as well as guide RNA will make um, a single double strand cut at the site that we're interested in. And in the repair mechanism, a small proportion of the plants will have an error that will um, uh, ultimately uh, knock out the gene by not uh, creating a, a biological situation, uh, a stop codon, where uh, the reading of the actual gene will be uh, stops right in the middle and it won't be fully expressed. So uh, with that turning off of the gene, then we can evaluate for uh, reductions in susceptibility. So just to quickly wrap up here, uh, we focus in our lab more on pre-breeding techniques. So uh, creating information and tools for uh, the augmentation and acceleration of conventional breeding towards the goal of uh, making a, an elite cultivar with uh, disease resistance uh, for fire blight. So some of the ways I've listed here uh, that we're interested in are identifying resistance genes and resistance QTLs to fire blight in sexually compatible species like Malsiversii that has the moderate fruit quality and, um, and strong resistance uh, identified already in the species. Um, we're looking at natural variation within susceptibility genes. One I didn't mention, uh, but is uh, interesting development is a rapid cycle breeding, utilizing um, early flowering genes, uh, early flowering transgenic genes in, um, in apple genotypes that you can essentially, uh, it'll flower within the first year rather than the fifth. So you can accelerate your breeding cycles and make more crosses to pyramid and stack multiple resistance genes or resistance QTL uh, into a single plant. And then uh, the genome editing approaches I mentioned here, knocking out susceptibility genes, but also doing a what's called a cisgenic approach where you can take a resistance gene from a wild species and uh, incorporate that into a susceptible cultivar such as Honeycrisp or Gala uh, and it'll confer resistance that way also. Um, so yeah, just to finish up here, there's you know, interesting technologies and, and interesting approaches that are um, coming up, but there is no one silver bullet. And if we are going to uh, achieve that target in a reasonable amount of time, uh, the best approach is to utilize everything where it is most appropriate. Um, to ultimately augment and accelerate the conventional breeding as the foundation. So, uh, yeah, I just want to thank 
some of our funding sources, the USDA, ARDP, as well as our uh, lab members and Dr. Khan. Um, and yeah, if anybody has any questions, I, uh, I know we're a little over time here, but um, yeah, I'd like to thank everybody again. All right, great. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of today's speakers and everybody who's participated.